But welcome again, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so again, this is our workshop on strategy, tactics, and escalation um, in the Medicare for All movement. Um, so thank you guys so much for being here. My name is Jasmine. I'm a community organizer with National Nurses United. I'm calling in today from Ohlone land, also known as Oakland, California. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm going to be helping to facilitate um, today's workshop for y'all. Um, and um, I'm just going to pass it over now as well to my co-facilitator, Max, um, who can introduce himself as well. Hi, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Uh, my name is Max, also a community organizer on the team at National Nurses United. I'm calling in from Kumi Island, also known as San Diego, normally sunny San Diego, currently overcast. Uh, pronouns are he, him, and uh, really excited for this workshop. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thank you, Max. And yeah, thank you, everybody, so much. Um, so um, let's quickly go over what we're going to be covering in this workshop today. Um, so the purpose of today's workshop is to explore the goals, uh, to explore what goals, strategy, tactics, and escalation are. Um, we're going to be talking about this specifically in terms of running um, either a local, a state, or even a national campaign on Medicare for All. Um, we're going to start out with an overview of exactly what we mean by strategy, uh, goals, and tactics, so the definitions of them. Um, we're going to cover the differences between them, which is important to understand. Um, and we'll talk about what escalation is and when it should happen, um, if it does happen in your campaign. We're also going to go over a ton of different um, tactics, what they are and how you might use them. Um, in your community. And then for our final bit of time to, um, together today, we're going to go into breakout groups, actually, and we're going to um, go into some small groups and actually practice these skills um, so that you can um, get some hands-on experience. So with all of that said, um, let's go ahead and dive right in. All right. So the purpose of all of this is to teach you about basically campaign building 101. Um, there are five components to any good campaign plan, and we're going to talk about um, identifying and building out those five components. So I'm going to tell you what those five components are right now. They are, number one, your campaign objective. Number two, your campaign goals. Number three, your campaign strategy. Number four, your campaign tactics. And number five, escalation if necessary that you um, you're going to use all five of these things to build out any campaign um, that you organize now again today we're going to think specifically about how this applies to campaigns within the movement to win medicare for all um, but just so you know this is a general framework that can apply to any campaign any issue that you basically ever work on in your life and the great thing is Anyone can do this. If you identify these five things and write them down and start to map them to a timeline, you have a campaign plan. Anyone can learn how to do this. Um, and we're gonna teach you how to do it today. All right, so I'm gonna go through each of these one by one. First and foremost, let's talk about number one, objective. So I hope we know what our objective is altogether. Um, in our case, our objective is to win and enact a Medicare for all system in the United States. Um, if that's not your goal, you might be at the wrong conference. Um, that's our overarching objective, right? Um, and campaign goals that we identify within that should all always be building towards our overall objective. And if they aren't, we can't identify how our plan is, if we can't identify how a campaign plan is working towards our objective, we might want to reconsider our campaign, right? All right, so that's number one. Number two, let's talk about goals. So what exactly do we mean by goals? Um, even before we get to strategy, tactics, we need to know first what our goal is. So who are we trying to influence? Do we have an organizing target? And what are we asking? Our organizing target to do? What's our goal, right? In our work, um, in our Medicare for All campaign at NNU, this is usually um, asking a member of Congress or a senator to do something that makes progress towards um, the fight for healthcare justice. So maybe it's to co-sponsor HR 17, 1976, um, the Medicare for All bill in Congress. Maybe it's to sign our Patients Over Profits pledge to refuse industry donations. Or maybe it's to be a more vocal and active supporter of Medicare for all. Those are some goals that you might have in some campaigns that you might work on. 
Um, in addition to identifying your overall campaign goal, it's always a good idea to break down a few more sub goals that are going to bring your campaign to victory. Um, if your overall goal is to get your member of Congress to co-sponsor Medicare for all, your campaign sub goals that might help you build progress towards that demand, right? So maybe you're trying to build public support. So what, is, what are your goals within that, right? Maybe you're trying to put public pressure on your target. You know, how and when are you doing that? Those are other kinds of goals, um, sub goals that you might think through. All right, so that's goals. Um, one more thing we wanna teach you about goals before we move to strategy. When you're naming your goals, I want you to remember this acronym. So the acronym here on the slide is SMART. Very easy to remember. You always want to um, come up with goals in your campaigns that are SMART, S-M-A-R-T. It's a really useful um, acronym to help you remember all the elements um, of a well thought out goal. So these letters stand for S is specific. Be as specific as possible. So who is involved? Who is your organizing target or who is your audience, right? The M stands for measurable. So you wanna be able to always measure success of your campaign um, and meeting your goal, right? So let's say you wanna get, uh, you wanna you know, have some kind of action, you wanna make that, you wanna get X number of people to do Y action, right? Make your goal measurable. Um, the A stands for achievable. <laughs> Can you do it? What's our capacity with our group? Can we achieve this? How many people are in our group? What resources do we have, right? The R stands for realistic. So sort of related to the last point, um, you'll want to ask yourselves, will we do it, right? Do we care enough about this to work towards this in the long term, even if it gets hard? Um, do we have sufficient time as a group of, probably a group of volunteers to dedicate ourselves to this goal? And finally, the T in uh, SMART stands for timely. Um, so what's the timeline, right? By what date? do we want to accomplish our goal? Give yourself a deadline for your goal. So that's the SMART acronym. I hope that's helpful. Um, now, once you've identified a goal or goals that meet these criteria, it's time to think about how you will achieve your goal. Now, this is your strategy. So very simply put, your strategy is the overall plan that you wanna use to influence your organizing target and achieve your goals. It's your theory on how you will make the changes you want to see happen. I want you to think of this as like your roadmap or like your game plan, um, like you see here on this picture on the slide. It's really important to remember, this is the biggest thing we want you to take away from this workshop today. It's really important to remember that your strategy is different than your tactics. Tactics are action steps that you will use to carry out your strategy. And we're going to talk about tactics more in just a second, so it'll make more sense then. But you should always, always, always decide your strategy first and then choose tactics that fall into your plan and help advance your strategy. There's a few questions that you can consider when creating your strategy, like who is your target? What decision maker or makers are you trying to influence? How can you influence those people or that person? Do you need to give them an opportunity to be a champion and look like a hero? Or do you need to pressure them? Or do you need to shame them, right? Those are some questions you might ask. And all of those are gonna help you arrive at a strategy that's gonna fit the best. You wanna think about what it's gonna take to influence them um, and, and you know, what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of pressure or, um, or celebration is needed to move that person to do what you want them to do. Something else that can be helpful um, to do is to identify a couple of different possible strategies and then look at them and then choose between them, right? By doing this, you can delineate between different approaches and then figure out what feels the most appropriate. So for example, let's say that you wanted to get your member of Congress to sign the Patients Over Profits Pledge and commit to stop taking donations from the healthcare industry, right? One possible strategy would be to publicly shame them, right? Draw attention to the money they, they take, right? And, and shame them out in public. Another possible strategy would be to increase public support so that that rep feels that they have the support needed, right? You want to encourage them to do the right thing and, and focus on public support. Um, you might consider both of these strategies um, and look at both of them and then determine which one would be more helpful in your particular circumstances. All right, so last but not least, 
let's talk about tactics. And then I'm gonna pass it over to Max. Um, so what exactly are tactics? They are the ways that you try to advance your strategy. They're the action steps that you take. If your strategy is the recipe, the tactics are the ingredients. That's the, the, um, the I forgot the word. That's the example, the, the, what do you call it? Um, analogy. The, um, the analogy, thank you, Max. That's the analogy we want you to remember. Um, so yeah, if your tactics, if your strategy is the tactics or the recipe, tactics are the ingredients. Um, so we'll consider a few examples. Um, so is your strategy focused on demonstrating public support, right? Tactics you might choose could be driving phone calls, collecting petition signatures, or holding a text bank party to text voters and identify supporters. Um, another example, does your target need to be publicly pressured? Tactics you might choose are a press conference, um, a rally outside their office, or letters to the editor. I want you to remember that, um, again, tactics are different than strategy. So a rally outside your member of Congress's office is not a strategy. It's one tactic that should be part of a larger plan. Collecting petition signatures in itself is not a strategy. It's one tactic that should be part of a larger plan. So with all of that, I'm gonna pass it over to Max um, to take us through the next section. All right, thank you, Jasmine. So very quickly, just to recap before we, we move on here. Um, first is you wanna make sure that you have an overall objective in mind and you make sure, and, and you wanna also make sure that your plan is, is building towards that objective. That's number one. Um, second, you want to craft the SMART goal that Jasmine just went over. So again, that's specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and uh, timely or time bound. Um, third is you wanna identify how uh, again, how you are creating the changes necessary for your goals to be achieved. And again, just like um, Jasmine just talked about, this is your strategy. And then finally, um, you specify the tactics. That's really the last thing that you do. And tactics um, or, or action steps that you're going to utilize to carry out your strategy. And so once you have all of these things, you have your objective, you have your goals, your strategy, your tactics mapped out, um, and you can apply them to a timeline, then that's, that's your campaign plan right there. Um, that's just how you, you know, build a really, you know, strategic and kind of well-balanced campaign plan. So it's pretty, it's actually not, not too hard when you kind of break it down. So from, from there, let's, let's kind of pivot and let's talk about some places where you can hit some snags with, with campaign planning. So uh, a very common pitfall um, can be having a goal or um, having a strategy that is really uh, vague or, um, you know, not defined enough or, or, you know, perhaps not achievable. And so an example of a vague goal might be, you know, we need to build support in our area for Medicare for all. So uh, it sounds, sounds good, but it's a, it's a bit vague, right? So we need to be more specific. So we need to, you know, fill in some details such as how are we going to do that? Um, we also want to avoid goals that are arbitrary. So for example, um, you know, we want to write 10 letters to the editor. Um, so that that might not be the best way to approach it because you know you might not have a reason for why 10 in particular is uh, is an impactful number. And you also want to be careful to avoid um, utilizing tactics that don't help meet the goals or or don't meet the strategy. That's also really important. So for example, um, you know doing a honk and wave to pressure a member of Congress to support Medicare for all. Um, so you know that might be a fun tactic to do, but, you know, a honk and wave is is probably not the best tactic for that particular strategy since it's not it's it's pretty unlikely that it's going to you know cross your member of Congress's radar, and so that's not going to be necessarily creating the pressure that you're looking for. So you always have to kind of examine that. Um, and I, I think a final best practice in working through your goal, your strategy, and your tactics um, planning is always maintaining uh, clear communication, uh, you know, in our, in our case, you know, for the example of, um, you know, trying to move a particular elected official, always maintaining co uh, clear communication with your target's office, um, which I think sometimes goes by the wayside, but it's really, really important. Um, it's, it's it really important that the person that you're trying to, uh, you know, pressure uh, is aware that you're organizing um, and they're aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it. 
And, uh, you know, by, by, you know, making sure to simultaneously as you're doing your tactics, um, you know, to make sure that you're, you know, simultaneously communicating directly with them and telling them what you're doing, you know, you can really ensure that they are noticing the pressure, they're putting together the, the dots, um, and they know who's responsible for the pressure, um, and important, really importantly, you know, who to go to to make it stop, right? Who, you know, who to go to, um, who to, to agree to the demands to make it stop. So um, from there, let's talk about, a, you know, potentially a final step in, in campaign planning, which is escalation. And I think that's everybody, always everybody's favorite. So what, what do you do when your tactics aren't working? You, you've put together a campaign plan, you've figured out a strategy, figured out your tactics, um, you've started you know, uh, uh, executing your tactics, but maybe they're not working. So sometimes this means that you should rethink your strategy, um, but, and, and you know, maybe it's not time to escalate, but um, sometimes it means that you need a, a different plan or, or maybe a better plan. Sometimes though, you know, you really made your campaign visible and you've kind of hit a crossroad, right? Um, in that case, it might be time to escalate. So, so I'll give you an example here. So maybe your organizing target has, um, you know, clearly noticed the pressure and is choosing to just ignore it um, after being given a chance to, to directly respond to it. So, or, you know, perhaps they've responded to it and they've said, no, no, I'm not going to agree to your demand. So you might again, consider coming back to chart out a new strategy of escalation. And that's where you kind of take things to the next level with a new strategy or new tactics. And escalation might mean choosing a strategy and tactics that make your target stance known. So if they said no to your demand, um, do you have a quote? Um, and even better, do you have a video or an audio clip of, it, of them saying no? Um, you know, what kind of strategy and tactics can you build out to publicize that, right? Let the public know about where your target stands to, you know, use that to build more pressure on them. And once you do that, how can you, again, capture people's reaction to escalate further? So that could be, you know, flooding their office with phone calls or some sort of direct action outside of their office. Um, escalation could also look differently than that. Um, you know, it's it's a pretty, pretty uh, wide kind of term. There's a lot of things that fall under it. So maybe you've identified a weakness or some, you know, vulnerability that they have. Uh, maybe it's that they, you know, depend on a few key donors or endorsers um, who might be upset to hear that they don't support your uh, demand. So maybe that's a wedge that you can use to kind of uh, escalate. Um, so in, in that example, you could call those people, right? Let them know, try to, again, try to drive a wedge and um, yeah, escalate. Um, and this is going to look different for every campaign. Obviously, I'm just using one example, but you can hopefully, uh, you know, hearing this kind of envision how it might work in other examples too. But I think the bottom line is, and what's most important is that your group is asking yourselves um, two questions before you escalate. And this is important because people are always very excited to escalate. Um, the first question you need to ask yourself is, do we need to escalate yet? Um, so has the target said no or have they clearly ignored, uh, ignored your organizing? Um, did you try everything that you could before escalating? Um, it, you know, it's really important to answer this for yourselves um, as honestly as you can and not escalate too soon. Um, if you escalate too soon, then you run a couple different risks. Um, a big one is you, you could risk alienating your target. And so you can kind of also think of an escalation as a sort of no going back scenario, right? You can't un, it's, it's very difficult to unescalate, right? Uh, not to say that you shouldn't do it. Um, it definitely has a really important role in, in campaigns. Um, in many cases, you should escalate, but it's, I think my point here is that it's just really good to be thoughtful about when you do it. And uh, yeah, if it's too early or, or an appropriate time. If you answer yes, that uh, we do need to escalate, so the first question, then I think the second question that you're going to need to ask yourself is how should we escalate? So what do we know about our target at this point um, about their vulnerabilities? Where would they, where are they especially vulnerable to feel pressure? What sort of leverage do we have? What power do we have? Answering those questions, that's going to help, uh, help you make a new plan with a new goal and a new strategy and some new tactics um, if need be. So now that you have sort of this overview, um, we've kind of gotten over the basics of the goals, uh, strategy, tactics, escalations. Yeah, hopefully you have a sense for their kind of basic definitions. 
Um, we're going to take a quick step back and, and we're going to uh, focus back on strategy um, a little bit more uh, in depth for the next few minutes. So I'm going to go over uh, a really helpful tool that can help you um, to, to kind of determine your campaign strategy. So this graphic that you're seeing uh, on this slide shows four different quadrants of basic strategy types. And you can, you can use this graphic to assess your campaign and decide which box your campaign mostly fits into. So as you can see, um, there's the four quadrants are kind of based on two different factors. And those are whether our target is with us or against us, and then whether the public is with us or against us. And then the combination of, of any of these two factors will lead us to what type of campaign strategy we should pursue. So let's, let's just take a moment to kind of go through each one of these. Um, the first one in the top left is, uh, is labeled hero. And so this is where our target is with us and the public is with us. So for example, again, we're going to just continue using this example of like a member of Congress. So let's say we have a member of Congress who is, is progressive, they support Medicare for all, um, they'd be interested in doing more, but they haven't prioritized it. So, you know, maybe, maybe it's the case that if someone asked them to do more, the right person asked them to do more, like holding a town hall, um, calling for a hearing in a specific committee, then they would, they would probably do it. Again, they're, they're aligned with us. Um, and their district, uh, you know, is very supportive of Medicare for all. So here, a good strategy would be to make that public support more visible to the member of Congress, use it to ask them to do more. Um, and as a result, they get to look like a hero. And so that's kind of why we call this the hero strategy. We're giving our target an opportunity to be a hero, basically. Um, they probably do the right thing, but they need a little bit of a push from, from us to do it. Uh, and so this type of uh, campaign would be very positive and very, very high road. And then right next to hero, right uh, just to the right of it, in the top right uh, quadrant, um, we have uh, pressure. So in this scenario, the organizing target is not with us, but the public is. So um, our goal here uh, is to create pressure, to, to um, create some friction, right? So let's say that our, our member of Congress is a Democrat who does not support Medicare for all, even though their district is very supportive of, of, uh, of the proposal. So our group might pursue a strategy to demonstrate that public support exists, and then we might escalate if that original strategy doesn't work. So we might ask uh, to meet with them and ask them to support. And if they say no, then we let them know that we're going to be moving to the, our next tactic. Maybe we're going to start phone banking voters in their district uh, to let them know about the, the member of Congress's lack of support. Again, creating that friction uh, and starting to slowly turn up the heat, slowly escalate. Um, in the bottom left corner, we have political cover. So this is a scenario where our organizing target wants to be with us, but just doesn't see the public support yet. Um, and so it's less that the public is against us and more that they are, uh, you know, neutral or apathetic or, or just not mobilized. Um, so, for example, maybe a member of Congress says, I would support Medicare for all, but, um, you know, it's not popular uh, in my district. My district doesn't want it. So that means our job is to build and show public support. So the group might be, uh, or the group might make a plan to um, collect um, a given number of signatures from the district in support of Medicare for all. Um, and then maybe you plan a delivery action to the member of Congress where you're delivering all the petition signatures, you're making a, an event out of it, right? Um, so that, that's just one example. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, we see a big stop sign. So um, this, this quadrant is if the organizing target is against us and the public is against us. Um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't work on it. That, that's, we don't have the right ingredients for success in that case. Uh, we should move on, right? Fortunately, uh, you know, especially when you're, we're talking about Medicare for all, this is very rarely the case. Um, so uh, most of the most of the um, campaign planning you're going to run into is going to fall into one of the other three quadrants. So when you're coming up with a strategy, whether it's for local Medicare for all organizing work or just kind of any general campaign that you're going to work on, you always want to you know refer to this graphic, think back to this, and ask yourself those two questions. Um, is our target with us or against us? And then second, is the public with us or against us? And based on your answers to those two questions, sort yourself into one of these quadrants, one of these categories, and then from there, craft a campaign strategy that fits, um, that fits the, the kind of um, uh, intentions of that quadrant. 
So with that, um, we're going to shift a little bit. We're going to start talking about tactics. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to pass it back over to Jasmine. Thank you, Max, for that fantastic overview. I hope that you all um, you know, find this, uh, this tool really useful. I know I sure do. Take a screenshot of it now, or I think this is being recorded, so I'm pretty sure you can access this later. Um, but definitely use this tool. It's, it's really helpful. But like Max said, now what we're going to do um, is go to the next part of our workshop and talk more in depth now that you have the definitions and talk more about tactics. Okay, so this is a really long but non-exhaustive list um, that you might choose to use in any campaign that you're working on. Um, it's important to note that a lot of these tactics here on the slide um, are involve in-person events and organizing. Therefore, we would recommend particularly um, representing a, a nurses union that you take as many measures as you can to mitigate risk while we are still in the middle of a pandemic, despite what some people may say. Um, our organization has developed some guidelines for safely protesting and taking action amidst the pandemic. Um, we will drop that link in the chat right now. If you wanna hold on to that, highly encourage you to use these guidelines in your own organizing to make sure that you stay safe. But just for now, for hypothetical, we're gonna, um, you know, talk about all these tactics, um, many that you can use in, in non-pandemic times, um, but some that you can use, um, during, you know, right now that we've, we've certainly been using the last few years um, in our campaign. So what you're going to see me do is talk about these in order of like least to most escalation. So that's the way that you can kind of think about, you know, you starting off by using some of the earlier ones, and then we'll get to some of the ones, ones you might choose to use if you really need to escalate. All right, this is gonna be a rapid fire list. I'm gonna talk about every single one of these very briefly, so here we go. All right, so first up, um, a door-to-door -door canvas. So um, at a door-to-door -door canvas, um, that's Max. <laughs> at a door-to-door -door canvas, you and your group of volunteers would literally go door-to-door, um, -door, engaging people in a given neighborhood um, about their support for an issue. You would talk to folks about the campaign, and then you would always end that conversation with some kind of call to action. Maybe they ask them to make a phone call, sign a petition, sign up to join your campaign, come out to an upcoming event, et cetera. This is a great way to build public pressure on your elected officials um, and also to grow the power of your movement since every supporter you identify becomes a potential new member of your campaign. Um, planning a door-to-door -door canvas, it's not that hard. It often involves just choosing a neighborhood where you're going to do it, sometimes cutting a list of doors to knock on, although it's not necessary, you could just go and knock on every door on the street, and then preparing just a few materials, basically clipboards, pens, and some printed out, you know, sign up forms, maybe a script for people to use. All right, so that's a door-to-door -door canvas. And again, I'm going through these quickly. We'll, we'll talk more at the end about how you can like get involved and learn more about these with our campaign. But just for now to share with what they, what they are and what they, what they involve. All right, so a crowd canvas. This is kind of like a door-to-door -door canvas, except instead of going to houses in a neighborhood, instead you and your fellow canvassers stay stationary at a high foot traffic location. Um, some people also call this street canvassing. Some examples for this um, for good locations would be farmer's markets shopping centers, public parks, um, downtown areas near public transit, right? Um, same thing here as door-to-door -door canvassing. It's a great way to grow public support and pressure since you're asking folks to take some kind of action to join you. Similar materials are, are needed, clipboards, you know, printed petition sheets and some pens, really not that hard to pull together. Next, we're talking about phone banking. So a phone bank is where you gather a group of people together. It can be in person, like here from the Bernie campaign, or it can be virtually here on Zoom. Um, you might be calling people from the voter file. Um, you might be using an automatic dialer, um, or you might just be manually calling through a like you know paper list of supporters or a list of supporters in a spreadsheet. A phone bank can be used for a lot of purposes. Um, it can, you can use it to turn people out to an event, drive calls to your elected official. Um, to organize one of these in person, you might um, need to reserve a space to do it, right? Maybe a room at a community center or someone's living room. Um, to organize a virtual phone bank, you just need a you know, Zoom link or other kind of like you know, video meeting link. And again, you just need some basic materials for this, like a list of people to call and a script of what you want to say on the phone. 
really easy to pull together. Next, we're going to talk about a text bank. So a text bank is where you and a group of people gather together. Um, again, could be in person or virtually to send large numbers of text messages, maybe to voters, maybe to supporters. Um, Text banking is actually not done on your phone in the way we think about it. It's done on your computer. You could do it on your phone. That would be more like relational, you know, go through your contacts. But text banking for these purposes is, um, you know, on your computer. In our campaign, we use a, a platform called Through Text, which is a website where you can send hundreds of text messages out to voters or supporters and have one on one conversations with each person who replies. Kind of like a phone bank, but it's texting. All right, so the next tactic I want to go through is a car caravan, a very popular one we've certainly been utilizing in the pandemic. You can see some pictures here throughout the last two years. A car caravan is where you gather a group of people together to drive a specified preset route and you decorate your cars otherwise or otherwise, you know, draw attention to your issue. Um, your car caravan might often start or end at a high visibility location or a symbolic location like your elected official's office, for example. Um, a car caravan is a great uh, tactic for publicly shaming or pressuring your target if you're driving past their office with Medicare for all all over your cars. And it's a wonderful COVID safe tactic to utilize, like I said, during the pandemic. Organizing one of these events is really simple. It's choosing a preset route and a meeting place and getting the word out and giving people some information to decorate their cars, maybe bringing some of your own signs if you can. All right, so that's a car caravan. Next, we're gonna talk about um, an educational event forum or panel. Um, so this uh, is a tactic that will, would allow you to educate the public in your area about why they should join your fight, right? You could screen a film. You could gather a group of local experts to speak on a panel. Um, you could facilitate a public discussion right um, on the issue. This one is really great for building public support, right? Like, um, you know, Max is going over this category of strategy. If we decide we need to build more public support in our area, this would be a great tactic um, to, to use in the, um, the political cover strategy. All right, so that's that tactic. Next, we're going to talk about a legislative visit. And again, I'm going through these quickly, but it's just to give you an overview of them. So a legislative visit is when you organize a group of people, usually should be constituents of that, you know, elected official to have either a face-to-face -face or, you know, virtual face-to-face -face meeting um, with your target or with their staff. Um, this can be done again, either in person or virtually. Um, and a legislative visit gives you the opportunity to get your target on the record and to address, uh, directly address their concerns or their questions, um, and to demonstrate the level of support that you have for, you know, for Medicare for All. This also might sound intimidating if you've never done it, but I want you to know that it is really easy to do. For members of Congress in particular, they have district offices, multiple district offices per district, and those offices and their staff are literally there for the purpose of meeting with you. That's what their job is, right? It is not very difficult to call or email a district office and ask for a meeting either with staff or with the member of Congress themselves, gather a group of constituents together, prepare an agenda, assign some roles and run the visit. And you can see an example here um, where our dear friend Adi Barkin was involved in this ledge visit with Representative Carbajal uh, from the Santa Barbara area. And shortly after this legislative visit, Representative Carbajal signed on to Medicare for All, which is really exciting. All right, so that's a legislative visit. Now I'm gonna talk briefly about letters to the editor, also sometimes called LTEs. Um, so these are letters that appear in an opinion section of a newspaper, right? If you've ever you know, read a newspaper, people still do that. You can, uh, they are still very effective and they have opinion sections um, and anyone can submit an LTE to a local newspaper. They can give you an opportunity to spread your message directly to a large audience. This can be very good um, for publicly shaming or calling out your target. Um, members of Congress, senators, they almost always um, have uh, like staff that are responsible every single day for pulling out news clips where their name appears. If you write a letter to the editor and you name your member of Congress in the letter, 
it is very likely that the next morning some staffer has to pull that letter to the editor with their name highlighted and it's included in the news clip. So it's a great way to get your message directly to your target. Um, is the, this is often the case for um, you know, lo more local elected officials as well. All right, so that is the list of tactics you might cho you know, choose to think about before you move to the escalation piece of your campaign. So these next few tactics would be good to, to consider if you think it's time for a bit of escalation. We're not all the way there, but let's take it to the, just the next level first. All right, so a petition signature delivery. Um, if you've been gathering petition signatures in support of your issue, you can make an even bigger impact if you organize an event around the delivery of those signatures to your target. Um, you can notify the press that you're doing this. You can even hold a press conference. We'll talk about that in a second. And this is a great tactic for the pressure category of strategy or the political cover um, category. You can put all of your physical petition signatures like these folks with this NHS campaign did into boxes, print them out and put them in boxes, physically deliver them to your target's office, right? You could also do something more symbolic like deliver a letter that has a link to you know the list of online signatures that you have it's a little more a little more environmentally friendly um so that's one one a little more escalating thing the next is a press conference so holding a press conference another great way to draw very public attention to your target um, a press conference is simply an event where you invite local press to hear speeches from your group um, usually this needs to be to announce something that's newsworthy. But again, that can be anything. It can be to announce that you're doing a petition signature delivery. Um, it can, you know, be anything like it can be something like your member of Congress told your group that they won't support Medicare for all. You can hold a press conference and turn that into the news, right? A press conference might sound like a hard thing to do, but I want you to know, again, truly anyone can do this. It's really easy to do. You can make this as simple as gathering in a park or on a sidewalk somewhere, right? Um, have some couple speeches ready to go, some people involved in your efforts, and then just invite your local newspaper. That's a press conference, right? It can be on the sidewalk, outside of City Hall. Anyone can do that. Um, ahead of your event, you would write what's called a press advisory. You basically just, it's just a document that says what's going to happen at the event or at the press conference. And then you email it out to local newspapers or TV stations, and you follow up by calling their offices and asking them to attend. And then after your event, you would uh, send out what's called a press release, basically a document that recaps what happened at the event or at the press conference. And you send that again to those same outlets that you want to cover your campaign. Um, I'm sort of really condensing that, but just to give you an overview. Um, and if you're persist persistent enough, news will cover you if you reach out to them and, and you ask them to. All right, so that's that one. Next, we're going to talk about packing town halls and public meetings. This was a bunch of us at a Nancy Pelosi town hall a couple of years ago. Um, we had a lot of fun sneaking these little signs in. Um, so uh, yeah, this is when you gather a group of people, again, either virtually or um, you know in person. Um, and you go to an event where your public is, where your target is going to be at, um, and you have everyone in the group publicly display, um, you know, their support for the issue. So let's say your member of Congress is organizing a town hall where they're going to be taking questions. You should get a bunch of people to go and ask questions about your can your target supporting Medicare for all. And if you're doing this for a virtual town hall or meeting, you might figure out ahead of time how public comment is being accepted, you know, what conference line to call in and you would virtually line people up to speak. All right, so I'm gonna say three more quick tactics about what you'd use if it's time for a high level of escalation. All right, so the first one is a rally or a march. I'm sure that you all know what a rally or a march is. I think I saw in the chat that um, Sandy Redding, one of our CNA, wonderful CNA presidents is here in attendance and she's here in this first photo. Hi, Sandy. Um, thank you for being here. If any other NNU presidents are here or CNA, I, I, I'll look for you in a second. Um, but this is a, a, some pictures from a, a rally in March we did back in 2019. I think you all know what this is. Um, you gather as many people as possible and you show the strength and the power of your movement. This is a great tactic for 
um, pressure or political uh, cover strategy because it shows your target just how far reaching support is, right? To organize a rally, um, you can usually just choose a public place like a plaza or a park. To organize a march in the streets, you normally either need to secure a permit uh, or at least let your local police department know about your plans. Um, you don't wanna risk arrest for, for everyone. Um, it can't hurt to at least call ahead to make sure that you know what the procedure is because you really don't want, really don't wanna um, have your attendees risking arrest. Um, you can also always avoid this by doing a march on a public sidewalk. Um, but yeah, it, it, normally not too difficult, but just want to flag that if you wanted to do a you know, march through the streets in your area, you um, would normally need some kind of permit or permission. So just be aware of that. Um, aside from that, though, organizing a march or rally um, just involves not a ton of things. Um, like organizing a few speakers and mostly just doing a ton of outreach to make sure a lot of people show up. You might also get some posters, make some posters, or ask your attendees to make some themselves. All right, so that's rally or march. The next one is direct action. So especially if your campaign has reached a point where escalation is needed, um, the direct action can be very effective. Um, direct action can be anything from a sit-in um, to physically blockading something with your bodies, um, to taking over a freeway with a march or blocking traffic, um, it can be a die-in action where a group of people demonstrates dying by laying on the ground and often blocking some kind of entrance or space. Um, in general, direct action means that you are directly using your power. It can be through economic means, like a boycott is considered a direct action, or through your physical body to draw attention to your issue and pressure your target to respond. This is particularly useful if your target has been like very, very publicly ignoring you, right? Um, it's worth noting that sometimes arrest is a possibility during direct actions. Um, it's also worth noting that there is both nonviolent direct action and technically there is also violent direct action. At NNU, we will never ever condone or accept the use of violent direct action, but nonviolent direct action can have a time and place where it is effective. You can see some more examples here um, where some of our NNU leaders delivered a a uh, big pill full of Monopoly money to, I believe this is also Nancy Pelosi's office um, in Congress. And we taped some GoFundMes um, with, uh, with Band-Aids onto the front doors of the pharma headquarters in DC. So those are some examples of things you might do. And last but not least is bird dogging. Um, so this is a really fun one. If you haven't heard of this, you might be like, what the heck is that, right? Bird, bird dog, what, what was bird dogging, right? It's a funny name. Bird dogging is a tactic where one person or group of people approaches your target unannounced in a public space where they aren't expecting you. Um, you ask them about supporting your issue on the spot and you try to get an answer from them. And bonus points if you have someone behind you recording on a cell phone. This is a pretty simple tactic, but it has worked extremely effectively in the past. So if you remember the activist in this central picture here, the activist who approached Senator Jeff Flake in an elevator in the Capitol about his vote to confirm Brett Kavanaugh. That was an example of bird dogging, right? Um, you can do this tactic either by planning it in advance. If you know where your target will be, maybe they're gonna, you know they're gonna be at a fundraiser or at some public event. You can also just take advantage of this in the, in the moment, right? Like when activists have bird dogged elected officials when they see them at restaurants or at the airport. So, but again, that's one of the most escalating things. So be cautious before you do that. All right, so those are some of the tactics you might use in a local campaign. Um, and that list is just a starting point. So in fact, I think you all could probably come up with some additional tactics here right now. So can you think of anything that I didn't say on that list that you'd like to add? Please tell me in the chat right now, let me open the chat. Let me know in the chat if you can think of any other tactics you might use in a campaign that was not on this list. Anybody? Make sure you hit everyone and not just hosts and panelists. All right, Max says a sit-in. Yep, that's great. Sort of under direct action, but more specifically, yep. Any other, other ideas? Maybe we'll, billboard marketing, I love that. That's great. Yeah, a billboard, very, a great way to get your target's attention if it's time to escalate a little bit more, um, you know, 
definitely not something you want to do till you're ready, but it's a, that's a great, that's a great thing to call, call someone out. Awesome. Well, if folks have any other um, tactics to throw in, please uh, keep throwing those in the chat and we'll move to the next section. Um, one thing I'll say before I pass it back to Max, um, if you're ever looking for more resources on how to do some of these tactics, you are more than welcome to reach out to Max and I and to our campaign um, at our email address, which we'll drop in the chat. You can also um, get involved in our campaign um, and join our email list. We employ a lot of these tactics. Getting involved in our campaign is a great way to um, start working on a lot of these things locally in your area. So I think Max is gonna drop that link in the chat. If you haven't joined our campaign, um, please do. And we do a lot of this stuff all the time. Um, all right, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Max, who's gonna go over one last thing before we do our small group breakouts. All right, thank you, Jasmine. Also got a shout out, I think in the top right picture of that last, actually, can you go back one slide, Jasmine, real quick? Yeah, that top right picture um, actually is a, a great example of, uh, you know, this is our, our friend Anna Marta in, in New Jersey, um, bird dogging uh, Congressman Frank Pallone. And that was, I think at the end, if I remember correctly, that was at the end of a, a really strong campaign that 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 was very thoughtful and and featured escalation um, and was successful. They they got Frank Pallone to uh, to commit to uh, co-sponsoring Medicare for all, and he's uh, chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. So that was a that was a really big win. Um, all right, so um, we're going to move on here, and in just a minute, we're going to move into the breakouts, which should be a lot of fun. Um, but before um, before we do that, I'm going to talk about one other additional um, skill that you can use in campaign planning, and that is how to build a power map. And unfortunately, we don't have enough you know enough time to give this time it deserves to, to go really in depth on this um, because again, this workshop is mostly focused on strategy, tactics, and escalations. Um, but we will throw some resources in the chat. Um, we're going to put a couple links in the chat where you can learn a little bit more on your own time about power map, uh, uh, power mapping and power map building. Um, so you definitely encourage you to check that out um, as you have time. For now, though, I'm just going to kind of cover the basic definition. Um, and so uh, ba basically, the way that you use a power map is it, it's it's a tool that can help you understand sort of the political lay of land um, and the, the, the kind of circumstances that you're in. So another way of putting it is that it helps you understand the power dynamic um, of, of your campaign. And it can provide some additional guidance in, in which direction to go if you're not sure. And so a power map is gonna help you answer the question, who has influence on your target? Where do you have the most influence? Where do your allies have influence? Where does your opposition have you know, influence? Where do they fall on the map? And most importantly, it's going to help you and your group more clearly reveal what the path to win, which, which direction your campaign should go in. Um, it, it can help inform the strategy that you choose, the tactics that you pick. Um, and it can even you know, give you a hint as when to escalate if needed. Um, and so in just a minute, I'm going to show you what a power map it can look like. So before I do that, I'm going to, we're going to use a, uh, a concrete example for this. So we're going to talk about Representative Marcy Capture um, as, a, as, a, as a concrete example. And so um, Representative Capture is a, is a Democrat. She's uh, in, in the U.S. House. She represents Ohio's 9th District, um, which is part of Toledo all the way over to Cleveland. Um, and she used to support HR 676, which was an older version of Medicare for All. Um, and then in 2018, for whatever reason, she stopped supporting Medicare for All. She, she has not been a co-sponsor of Medicare for All since then. And she was first elected in 1983. She consistently wins her elections by huge, huge margins, um, in part because she lives in a very, very blue, um, you know, gerrymandered district. Um, she is white, Catholic, the longest serving woman in the House of Representatives. She's the daughter of Polish immigrants. Mother was a union organizer. Um, she can be progressive sometimes. She initially supported Bernie over Hillary in 2016. Um, she was very, very vocally against NAFTA um, because of its impact on, on the labor movement. Um, she, uh, as well as Dodd-Frank Dodd because it wouldn't uh, break up the big banks. Um, but on other issues, she's very moderate. Um, back in 2010, I think she made the news because she wouldn't vote for the ACA 
um, until she got assurances that it would not uh, um, fund abortion. Um, and I'll also note that her stance on that seems to have dramatically shifted. Um, but you know, I say all this to give you a little bit of background on her district because her district is an example of a great district to run a local campaign in. And we could probably move her to support again with the right power map, the right strategy, and the right tactics. So if we take a look at what, uh, what groups are in, uh, in her district, um, we, we can find that there are a couple of groups that we would call core allies. And so these are groups like uh, Cleveland DSA, um, Northwest Ohio DSA, um, a statewide group uh, in Ohio called uh, the Single Payer Action Network or SPAN. Um, and then what we also have um, are potential allied groups. And in this category, we'd put groups like the uh, local NAACP chapters, United Auto Workers or UAW, Amalgamated Transit Union or ATU, uh, American Postal Workers Union or APWU. Um, this is a district where, where labor unions have a lot of uh, influence. It's in the Rust Belt. Um, and some of these unions both support Medicare for All and are endorsers of Marcy Capture. And um, an another kind of just very quick note I'll make about labor unions supporting Medicare for All. Um, I think, you know, in this example, I'm using national union support as a sort of uh, approximation. Um, but, you know, you'll see it both ways. And what I mean by that is that you'll have sometimes a national or international union that supports Medicare for All, but the union local uh, is not very active on the issue or, or doesn't really, it's not, a, it's not a huge issue for the local. And sometimes the opposite are true. Sometimes that there's a really progressive union local that is all about Medicare for All, even though the national union doesn't support it or, or is not vocal in support of it. Um, in either case, you can consider kind of a national endorsement, I think, to, again, be a sort of an approximation, um, but you should, I think, always do research um, or, or talk to folks on the ground in, in a district to get a better sense of where the union locals are really at. So um, we're going to go to the next slide. And this um, on the next slide, you're going to see an example of a power map. And we're actually using a template uh, which was developed by our friends at Healthcare Now, who are helping uh, host this conference that we're all in attendance at. Um, and in the diagram, you can look to the horizontal axis of this, of this graph to see that we have a range of support. So we, we have strong support all the way to strong oppose. And then on the vertical axis, we have a range of influence. And that goes from not influential all the way to very influential. Uh, and this is in terms of influence on our target, which again is represented in Marcy Capture. So to make a power map like this, you just, all you need to do is do the research to find out who are the key players in your community. Um, it could be groups, it could be individuals. Um, and then you also wanna know what their relationship is to your target. And so once you identify those players and you put them on a map, um, you, you, you just put them on the map where you think that they are appropriate. Just, um, and this is, you know, you have to kind of make a judgment call um, when you do that. Um, once you have that done, once you have kind of an initial array of groups and individuals on a power map, um, you have a nice little visual of the political landscape in your community for your campaign, and it's going to help inform your strategy moving forward. So in, in, in this instance, you can see that, um, you know, we've, we've drawn a line kind of going from the bottom left to the top right, um, and that is not what we want. What we want is a line going in the opposite direction. Um, with most of our most of the power on our side. So in other words, what we're really looking to do is it, we want we want to get an arrow that's going from top left to bottom right. And so what that means is that it, you know that but that's helpful, right? Because it helps inform what we need to do in this case um, to be in a position to win. And that is to work to move the groups that are in the middle to become more supportive. And then to organize to get the groups in the bottom left to, to get more power and influence, um, which again, you can kind of see uh, we've represented with the, the red arrows in this graph. So we're trying to move groups up and to the left. Um, so um, you can kind of see there um, how this power map starts to inform um, where you go next. Um, so if we were going to design and execute a campaign in Ohio's ninth district, um, what would our goal, our strategy, and tactics be? So if you, again, take into consideration 
some of the details uh, that I've kind of gone over now about the political train in the district. Um, I think some of the things that we can conclude are that in order to move uh, representative capture to support Medicare for all, our campaign strategy should focus on number one, moving our potential allies, um, and those that's the NAACP and the list of unions um, on uh, under number one right there, um, into a more active coalition with us. Again, those are potential allies. We wanna get them more active, more engaged. And then we also want to build up the power of our core groups. So these are groups that are already supportive, already firmly in the Medicare for All camp. We want to help get them more influence in this in this case. And that those are groups like DSA and Ohio Span. So based on this analysis of the district, you might decide on a medium term goal um, from that, again, first point, increasing active support from labor unions and captures district. And so we know that this goal is smart because you know you're looking for support from specific individuals. Uh, we know it's specific because you know you'll you'll know if you achieve it if you get their support. Um, it's measurable. We know that these um, unions are already you know friendly to our cause. It's attainable. This is something that is definitely possible. We you know it's been done elsewhere. It can be you know definitely is achievable. Um, it's realistic. Um, it's you know and uh, and then finally it's it's time timely or time bound. It's something that we can do in a in a specified uh, amount of time. And again, since Capture is not uh, currently a supporter. But we know the public in her district is with us. She again wins by huge, huge margins every every two years. Um, we know that this falls into the pressure strategy. Remember, um, thinking back to the the graphic with the four quadrants, it's definitely in the pressure strategy quadrant. So a potential strategy for this goal would be to engage those unions or the labor councils that they're members of, maybe um, to pass resolutions in support of Medicare for all and send letters to her office once they do. That, that is an example of, of something that you could do. Um, and now, you know, last but not least, um, we wanna kind of fill in some tactics that we could choose to, to fit in our strategy of, of getting these unions to pass resolutions and send letters to her office. So um, if you have thoughts on how we might do this, again, how we might get unions to, um, to, to pressure her, to pass resolutions, to send letters to her office, um, you know, asking her to support. Um, let us know in the chat. How, how would we do that? How do you all think that um, we could do that? You can think back to some of the tactics that, um, that we went through, that Jasmine went through, um, and maybe, maybe share any that, that might be relevant in this case. Um, again, the question is, how are we going to get those, how are we going to mobilize those kind of passive or potential allies, the list of unions in the district, um, to put some pressure on her? Um, if you have any ideas, put them in the chat. Phone calls to uh, the offices, yep, you could do educational forums, yep, that's, you could definitely do both of those things. Um, those are, those are great, great tactics to, for achieving this particular goal. Um, you could also do, um, you know, petition collection or delivery. That's another one. Um, but yeah, there's the, these are all these are all excellent. And that's that's really it. From there, you've got your power map. You've got a goal, a strategy. You've got a couple tactics. Um, and so you've got you know the the start of a, a campaign plan to get Marcy Capture um, to to support Medicare for all. Um, and we might add more to our overall plan. Um, than just this part, but you know, I think this is this is a really good start to to um, to, to kick things off. Um, so the last step, obviously, is to put the plan into action and to to get it done. Um, but hopefully, this has kind of been a helpful thought exercise where you can kind of see how you break it down and, and actually put together a, a campaign uh, plan. So I know that was a lot. Jasmine and I have been talking a lot, but the good news is that we are going to move into some breakout sessions. And um, what we're going to do in those breakouts is uh, you all are going to be able to talk amongst yourselves um, and uh, talk about a couple different examples um, and put some of these skills into practice. So um, you should have about 15 minutes, I believe, in the breakout rooms. And each group is going to get uh, each breakout group is going to get a worksheet, which we'll put in the chat. Um, and that worksheet is going to contain a prompt about, and it's going to be describing a potential situation where you might need to plan and execute a campaign plan. Um, and within your group, what you're going to need to do, um, and there are going to be more groups than there are facilitators, um, being, that being Jasmine and I. 
So we're gonna ask for your help in, uh, in facilitating these breakout groups. You're gonna need one person to step up as a note taker who can fill in the worksheet. These are, um, these are Google Docs, so, and they're all set to edit. So you just need to open up the link and then you can go ahead and type into it. So one person to step up as note taker to fill in the worksheet. Um, one person to help uh, facilitate the breakout to just make sure you're moving down um, and going through each question. Again, just basically entails reading the prompts, reading the questions on the worksheet, uh, making sure that the group is not spending uh, more than maybe like three minutes on each each question. And then, uh, so yeah, so you need a note taker and a facilitator. Um, once you get into the breakouts, um, essentially what you need to do is read the prompt, decide if the situation calls for a hero, a pressure, or a political cover strategy, um, and uh, you can describe why. Um, and then from there, you should flesh out the strategy a little bit more. From there, you should choose from the list of tactics. You should pick two or three tactics that you might use to execute that strategy. And then you can also write out why you chose those particular tactics. Um, and then the final step is to put those tactics in a timeline. And this is all laid out on the worksheet, so you don't have to remember that. Um, but it looks like Jasmine has put the worksheets in the chat. So uh, I think what we're going to do now is go ahead and open the breakout rooms. I believe you're going to be automatically assigned to one of them. And uh, depending on which one you're in, click the corresponding group link, and that'll take you to your worksheet. And uh, you'll be good to go. So let's go ahead and start those breakouts. And I think you're going to see a button that will allow you to join the breakout. Uh, Okay, there we go. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. All right. Um, I think we were only able to give folks like closer to like 11 or 12 minutes and not the full the full 15. So I'm sorry, we had a little bit less time and I'm sure folks were in the middle of some really good conversation. Um, I'm sorry if we had to cut you off early. We just want to end this workshop on time. Please um, share any insights in the chat that you that you had from your worksheets and Please do, um, you know, I hope that was a useful exercise. Please do um, hold on to those worksheets and just keep, you know, keep that as a reference um, for any group, any campaign with your ear with, you know, as an exercise to practice uh, strategy tactics and escalation. Um, so thank you everybody so much. Um, hope you had a good time. That is, uh, that is really it for our workshop for today. We want to give you all the full 15 minute break before the next block of workshops. So last thing I'll just say, um, thank you so much for coming out to this workshop today. We really appreciate it. We hope you learned a lot. If you have any follow-up questions after today, you're always welcome to reach out to us at info at medicareforall.org. That's our team email inbox. We are looking at that all the time. You're welcome to reach out to us there. Um, I hope that you learned a lot today or at least a little bit on strategy tactics and escalation. We're really grateful to all of you 
for being at this conference and for all your work to make Medicare for all a reality in the United States. So let's keep learning together. Let's keep making sure that we're staying accountable towards each other to running effective and smart campaigns. Um, so thank you everybody so much. We'll play some music to send us out and have a good block to everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. All right. Okay. Thanks, Vanessa. I think we, we have to close this out. Or should we just leave? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you.